lesson will be in capnography for EMS. Capnography is a tool that has been around in our industry for quite some time, at least the last few years. Most paramedics and EMTs would tell us that they've heard about it, know has some idea of what it is, however, don't truly understand exactly what it does, when it should be used, or even how to use it. What is capnography? Capnography is a measurement of exhaled carbon dioxide molecules. It's very important to know the amount of oxygen we put into a patient, but it's equally, if not more so important, to know and have a measurement of the exhaled carbon dioxide coming out of the patient. Capnography, or capno, meaning to blow smoke, or the study of exhaling smoke, is something that uh, can tell you many things about the condition of your patient. Things all the way from verifying placement of an advanced airway all the way down to the perfusion status of a potential shock patient. Capnography is measured, its unit measurement is millimeters of mercury. So let me ask, what other thing in EMS that we assess in patients is measured in millimeters of mercury? Blood pressure cuffs comes out of millimeters of mercury, pressure measurement. So capnography is also a pressure measurement. It is a measurement of the exhaled CO2, the partial pressure of the CO2 molecules that are exhaled from the patient's lungs. In the discussion of capnography, let's take a closer look at that. With this, we want to talk about what some of the abbreviations are. So the primary abbreviation that most people are familiar with was entitled carbon dioxide monitoring. With entitled carbon dioxide monitoring, or ETCO2, let's take a look at what that means. To start, let's have an introduction. Let's get our feet wet with what a capnography waveform looks like. So at the baseline down here, there is no breathing. And then as I exhale, then my lung empty out at the alveolar level, the alveolar plateau, and then I inhale back. At this point right here, at this very point, that is your measurement of your end tidal CO2. This is where your CO2, the partial pressure of those CO2 molecules coming out, again, being measured in millimeters of mercury, the millimeter mercury or the unit measure of pressure is represented right here on this y-axis as it goes along. So right here on my y-axis is like 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, and so forth. Where I want to be is around between 35 and 45 is where we really want to be with our millimeter of mercury. The point right here is where I come over and look to the left on this y-axis and depending on my markings right here, this is where it's going to register. There's also something you may see that is labeled the PETCO2. And what this is, is this is the peak end tidal carbon dioxide measurement. The peak that we're talking about is, boom, right there, at that peak where it peaks at its highest. So in an intubated patient, your most hands down definitive way of knowing that you have placed an endotracheal tube in the right place is seeing it go through those vocal cords. Aside from that, the most hands-down definitive way of knowing that that tube stays where you put it is capnography. If you have time to intubate somebody, you quite simply have time to utilize capnography. That being said, in the intubated patient, obviously verifying placement. So to verify placement, Alrighty, now it can also help me keep an eye on the patient's status. Alright, so in this situation right here, if my intubated patient is in cardiac arrest, I can expect maybe to see numbers on CO2 around 20 millimeters of mercury. Here's a key thing that if the number gets below or equal like 10 millimeters of mercury, that is a biggie right there because that tells me that my CPR is bad. Now, let's give an example. All of a sudden, I'm getting 20, maybe 25 millimeters of mercury. Then I see a 
sudden spontaneous or spontaneous increase of CO2 waveform and my height or my, my CO2, the level hits up around 30, maybe even 40. And, uh, but let's say I get up around here and I see that I have an improvement. That would be your earliest possible indication of a return of spontaneous circulation in your cardiac arrest patient. You would see that before you feel a pulse back. Makes you wonder how many patients may have actually had a pulse back over the years that I couldn't actually feel just yet and I didn't know it in time and I thought I was treating PEA when really there might have been something there. Capnography could have showed me that. We're going to talk more about bronchospasm now and how it relates to your findings on the waveform CO2. Remember that the hands down some of the best the old classics way of assessing bronchospasm is us listening for wheezes with your stethoscope that still stands we want to treat the patient not the monitors but with that being said let's also use these advanced diagnostics that the monitor can give us to look at a close take a closer look at the patient so I'll, uh, a recap of what a normal CO2 waveform is, as shown here. Again, it's that more like box-like structure. As we come over here to the side, we start seeing some abnormalities. In this situation here, this would be representative of a more mild uh, bronchial spasm, one that is becoming moderate. The patient will be very symptomatic at this point. And then as we get down here to where we have very much a shark fin like waveform again shark like a shark fin and with this shark fin type waveform this is a patient who is in extremis from the bronchospasm somebody that if we don't identify and treat appropriately they're going to be uh, in impending resuscitation and some uses of this obviously the types of patients who have bronchospasm so asthma um, even there could be allergic reactions and uh, some COPD patients. The one thing we really want to point out is to make sure that we carefully monitor the CHF patient. Somebody who is short of breath, cardiac history, hypertensive, they're probably in CHF. So we could actually do that patient more harm than good by giving them an unnecessary albuterol breathing treatment. The effects that the medication has on increasing myocardial oxygen demand by increasing that heart rate could actually be more harmful than beneficial for that patient. So, unless the CHF patient, or if it is an asthma patient, allergic reaction, or COPD patient, has more of a, and see the beginning right here where we have a straight incline, over here it's more of a mild hill, like a, a small slope starting, then the hill gets more steep as we level off. And then, I have a straight up, very steep hill type shape, and it takes the appearance of a shark spin coming out the top of the water. That's definitely coming after the patient, I promise you. Today we talked about capnography. We emphasized on what it is, who to use it on, when to use it, and hopefully a little bit about how to use it. We're not experts in the subject matter. There's folks out there know a lot more about it than I do. Just trying to be proactive with taking a little knowledge that we've learned around to share that. Hopefully it'll help somebody else in the field. Until we do our next video, we look forward to seeing you then. And I'm Chubby Little. Brent Dyer signing out.